This is Kenny Barron and I Rock Jazz. One of the primary things I learned from Dizzy is about uh, space, using space and building a solo as opposed to, again, playing everything you know all at once. It's like build your solo, sorry, you start down here and then you go up. You know, so a solo should have uh, hills and valleys, you know, it shouldn't just be, uh, you know. That's the, that's the one thing I learned from Dizzy, uh, musically. And then also, very, very important is how to treat people, how to deal with people, you know, how to be a band leader. Because, you know, by, I learned just by observing him how he led his band, you know. Uh, uh, well, he, first of all, he was very respectful of, of uh, Dizzy was very respectful of, of, of his musicians. He was very fair. Uh, I mean, there were certain requirements like, uh, not being late, being, you know, being on time, and, and uh, in general, just doing your job. If you did that, things were fine, you know. Well, that was a sore point for me. <laughs> uh, the, the attire, you know, uh, most bands during that period, during the 60s, wore uniforms, you know, and uh, having taken, I took, uh, again, Leo uh, uh, Lalo Shipman's place, and at the time, um, Leo Wright had also left the band. He was a saxophonist, and Moody took his place. I was unfortunate enough to have to uh, wear Leo Wright's jacket and Lalo Schifrin's pants. And we had these really, uh, uh, they were really ugly tuxedos. One was green, one was powder blue, and another was a regular tuxedo. And I guess it got really strange when uh, we, were, we were actually doing a TV show here in Chicago, uh, Mike Douglas or something like that. And uh, so the drummer and I, we wore our powder blue tuxedo uh, to the TV station. And then we got on the elevator. And the elevator operator had on the exact same thing with a cap. <laughs> so we said, Dizzy, it's time to get something else. <laughs> So uh, uh, when we got to Philly, there was a, a store in Philly that uh, a lot of musicians bought their uniforms or suits, uh, Crass Brothers. So we went to Crass Brothers and Dizzy picked out like three normal, normal suits for us to wear. So that was, uh, everybody said, <laughs> you know, because I couldn't handle wearing those, <laughs> those uniforms. <laughs> um, right after I left Dizzy, I just, I kind of freelanced uh, around New York for a while. And uh, when I left Dizzy, it was uh, kind of impulsive. Because I'd been there four years, and my wife was uh, pregnant with our second child. And I kind of wanted to stay in town for a while. Uh, but you know, when you're young, you do stupid things. So I, again, I quit impulsively, having nothing waiting in the wings, you know, and uh, didn't save a tremendous amount of money during the time I was with Dizzy. So uh, in the beginning, you know, when, right when I left, it was a little tough financially. You know, I had, uh, started sending out applications for day jobs and stuff, you know. Fortunately, I didn't have to do that. Uh, I started getting calls uh, from people like Stanley Turnty, which was a lot of fun. I worked with him uh, uh, at Minton's up in Harlem for about six weeks, just back to back, because you could have gigs like that during that time. Uh, and then uh, with other people. Uh, and then I got a call from Freddie Hubbard, uh, who uh, actually lived around the corner from me. And I started working with him. And I, I was with him on, off and off for a few years, in uh, different incarnations of uh, various bands, uh, you know, that he led. Um, and Freddie, and then uh, uh, Youssef Latif, which was a, a really great period for me. Uh, Youssef encouraged me to go back to school. And uh, which I did. I wound up going back to uh, Manhattan Community College, or going to Manhattan Community College, and got a, an associate's an associate's degree. And then later uh, went to uh, Empire State College, which was part of uh, New York State University, and got a bachelor's degree. 
So with Yusuf, that was really just a great experience. He was, he, uh, he was very encouraging of my writing. He uh, recorded a lot of my music. He encouraged me to write a lot. So, and then uh, after uh, Yusuf was Ron Carter. And that was, uh, again, another great experience. Uh, that was a band that had uh, two bass players. Uh, it was uh, Ron Carter and Buster Williams, Ben Riley, and myself. And uh, again, that was a unique combination. So traveling with that man was sometimes a little strange because he had two bases in it, flying. Yeah, but, and at that time, uh, uh, airlines would allow you to take bases inside the cabin. Uh, but they had to sit in the bulkhead seat. Then later on, you had to buy a half fare seat. And then eventually, you know, that, that went by the wayside, you know. Um, but anyway, and after Ron Carter, uh, I started leading my own trio after that uh, for a while. And then I got a call from Stan Getz. This was in the uh, 70s. I have no idea how he got my number. But the, the first time I worked with him was actually um, taking Chick Corea's place. And this was a band that was kind of a, what they called this Captain Marvel period. We were playing all of Chick's music. And the band included uh, Stanley Clark on bass and uh, Tony Williams on drums. So uh, for me, that was big fun, big fun. And that first period only lasted for maybe uh, uh, a couple of months, you know. Uh, we did some tours down south in uh, uh, Durham, Raleigh, North Carolina, and, and uh, a few other places. And then I didn't hear from, from him for a while. So most of that time, uh, I was just freelancing around New York with my trio, and, and with people would come into town, uh, like uh, Eddie Harris or people like that would come to town. And Busta Williams and Ben Riley and myself, uh, that was the trio. We would kind of act as a rhythm section for people who would come into town, Sonny Stitt people like that. Um, and then I got another call from Stan uh, a couple of years later. Uh, and I went out to California, he was living in California then, and uh, started working with him a little more regularly. And uh, it was, uh, again, great. You know, uh, we went to Europe uh, several times, and there were several, several different bands. I think the first band quartet was uh, maybe George Mraz and Al Foster. You know, so you know, we did a record out in California, you know. Um, and that was with Stan until he passed, you know. Uh, we did the, the uh, several recordings in Europe at uh, Montmartre. Trio, I mean quartet recordings. And then uh, we did the, the very last recording, which was People Time, which was the duo. And uh, that was actually the last time I saw them. We, we recorded... Uh, for about three days in uh, Copenhagen. And then we did one more concert in Paris. And uh, uh, he was sick at the time, uh, which he didn't know at the time. But, uh, uh, he died from cancer, but at the time, he was in a lot of pain. And that turned, in Copenhagen, that turned out to be a bleeding ulcer. You know, and uh, after uh, I, got back to, uh, I got back to New York, uh, I called him, because uh, uh, about a month later, to see how he was feeling. And he said he was doing okay and he was planning the next tour. So this was, must have been like April or May and he said, yeah, the next tour, we're gonna start June or July, something or other. And of course he died, uh, I think in June of, of uh, that year. You know, and uh, I, you know, I'm grateful that I had that experience uh, because he was such a lyrical player. And that's something I'm very much into is, is melody, you know, and uh, so for me, again, great experience.